end of February, so perhaps there will be an occasion then to uh, meet in person with the community. I'm reaching out Dean to meet you all. We will be talking today about um, optimizing Postgres performance, and uh, we will be specifically uh, focusing on parameter tuning. So here's the outline. We will be talking a little bit about uh, the introduction to this problem first, just to make sure that everybody's in, on, uh, on uh, the same page on uh, the problem setting. We'll specifically talk about the state-of-the-art uh, solutions about parameter tuning. And we will have an angle, which is a FinOps angle as well. So we'll try to uh, explain what are the consequences of not tuning the uh, parameters of your database instances. And we will uh, um, explore a slightly different solution than the ones that are available today uh, through uh, this machine learning uh, tuning uh, automation approach that we are uh, pushing forward at DB2. We talked a little bit about performance analysis on a number of benchmarks, and we'll talk a little bit about some real world uh, use cases where technology was run in, in production as well. Just uh, before starting, a little uh, introduction on myself. I'm the founder and CEO at DB2. DB2 has been around for about three years now, and uh, you are more than welcome to connect with me on either X or, or LinkedIn. Uh, these, are, these are the references there. Uh, I'm a professor in machine learning at Lund University as well, and I'm research staff at Stanford University in California. I have the past in uh, both academia and, and industry, was a postdoc at Imperial College London, and a software engineer at a fintech company in, uh, in Paris called the Murex SAS. Um, right, so this talk wouldn't be possible without the support of my team, uh, and uh, this is the DB Tune team. You can see uh, the uh, um, you know perhaps you can recognize some some of the people here in in this slide. Uh, the uh, team is composed by seven uh, operational uh, full-time uh, developers and uh, a number of advisors. Um, you may recognize um, angel investor uh, Peter here uh, from Procona, for example, or uh, the co-founder and CTO of of Neo4j, uh, Johan Svensson. And uh, very excited as well to have that partner for, for about three years now with Magnus Sagan there, um, who, is, uh, who is part of the uh, Express core team um, on, on this project. So what is database tuning and why, why is this important, right? So this is the idea of uh, keeping the uh, database fit and responsive. So we, we have seen uh, the very first talk in, uh, in this uh, session where uh, a lot of uh, a lot uh, you know a lot of the talk was about performance and and how to uh, you know perhaps use the tools available to analyze uh, the uh, the issues that may arise and, and this is all about performance uh, optimization and and the reason why uh, we have this type of problems often is that databases are a dynamic object and they, they change they grow and and slow down over over time. So the uh, problem is that not all uh, workloads are the same and not all machines are the same. So tuning uh, really uh, matters because what you want to do with tuning is to adapt a database to its current use case, load, and machine. So it's the combination of these things, right? So the database is running on a certain uh, server, hardware, machine, if you, if you wish. It's running a specific workload. The workload may change as well. And uh, what you want to do with tuning is to try to achieve high performance by tuning your your environment in a way that uh, um, you know this uh, the combination of workload, machine, uh, load are um, are uh, in, in in sync. So this is a dark art. Uh, it's a, it's something that is usually taken care of by database administrators and developers. Uh, this is a very challenging uh, job uh, usually. And uh, it includes includes various uh, type of um, uh, you know tuning, right? So they, and this was also mentioned by Shilesh in, in the first uh, in the first talk. So you can tune all sorts of things like queries, uh, database management system parameters, indices, and OS parameters, and objects, and, and things like that. So the list is long. Today we will focus on uh, parameter tuning, um, and uh, we will uh, specifically focus on that. But before digging into that part, from a um, technical perspective, um, database tuning matters uh, for uh, a number of reasons, right? So the throughput and latency are 
what um, you know we really care about usually. So we want to achieve high transactions per second and uh, low average credit run time. It of course improves scalability, enhances the stability and reliability, and of course it also takes uh, care of your SLAs, which are usually uh, extremely important in any in any business. There's also a business perspective, though, and um, you know if you run your database instances not peak performance, well, you may have a number of problems, right? First of all, you um, you uh, you know you will have a high um, cloud and infrastructure spend which you can mitigate with, with tuning, because you simply you would need more hardware to run your database operations. You will uh, increase the uh, end user satisfaction, you will reduce downtime, you know, increase productivity and, and have all sorts of operational efficiency, and even have a better uh, energy savings uh, policy in, in terms of ESGs, for example. So this is, uh, uh, you know, very often in a, in a technical, uh, from a technical perspective, we focus on the left side here, but the business side is extremely related to having this uh, database instances to run a high performance. So these things are actually uh, mirroring each other in, in many ways. So the problem specifically we'll be talking about today is parameter tuning. And, and uh, the parameter tuning problem is all about adjusting the parameters to best fit the uh, workload. And the problem looks pretty much like the picture you see on the, on the right side. So you, have, you have this console and you have all these different parameters. They have a certain uh, value ranges and uh, you, know, you play with them to find the best configuration uh, which is uh, given usually by a, a, a fairly large number of parameters and you play around with these knobs and you, you want to find the best uh, configuration of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of your database management uh, system. And parameters, when we talk about parameters of the database management system, we are talking about things like the buffers, uh, workmen, uh, max, uh, max parallel workers, maximum size, and etc. So this, this is long. Just to uh, give uh, an example, um, here for example, workmem uh, is the parameter that uh, uh, looks into, uh, well, controls the memory allocated for each operation within the query. So if you have operations like sorting uh, or, or uh, joins and things like that, you know, you, you will use a certain amount of memory uh, per uh, query, uh, within the query, and uh, this is governed by workmem. Another parameter that is very important is shared buffers, for example, where uh, you know how much memory uh, you uh, allocate for your page, uh, page cache. Right? So this is uh, very important not to uh, spill uh, all the time to, to disk, for example, if your application um, requires um, you know, to, to basically store in cache uh, all sort of like table uh, data and index data as well. However, these are just two examples. Of course, this is much longer. And uh, the uh, problem uh, very often is that uh, this uh, highly depend on the application. So the values that these parameters take really highly depend on the application in hand. So there is not a one capsule solution here. You really need to look at your application and try to find what are the best parameters for your application. And this, of course, would depend also on the uh, hardware you are, you are running on. So just to uh, give a, a very uh, a simple example here, um, I uh, created this uh, two-dimensional um, experiment here, where I'm using a synthetic workload, a very simple uh, uh, workload called resource stressor, which has been designed to, uh, to be disk bound and uh, in, in, in the bench-based benchmarking suite. So what you can see here is that uh, you have shared buffers and workmen here on the axis, and you have two put on the uh, on, on the vertical axis. So you can see, for example, here in this uh, toy example, you can see that in in a case where you're disk bound, you really want to uh, increase your shared buffers because that will allow you to um, basically not have uh, not have this spilling to disk uh, as often. But at the same time, the queries here are pretty simple, so workman doesn't really affect the performance uh, at all, I would say, because the queries are pretty simple. So this is a toy example, of course. It's a very simplistic example. Now, when you have a new application, of course, you need to figure out these parameters in a way that respond well to your application specifically. 
And uh, the problem setting is usually much more complex than this, right? So this is a toy example that was specifically designed for, for to, to be this bound. So you can kind of imagine if you know what your buffers and, and then what men uh, do, that uh, this will be a good, uh, a good solution. So the solution would be to take uh, a, sh a high shear buffer is over here, and it doesn't really matter what you take in terms of workman, so you will probably take a small uh, workman in that sense. Right, so the question that uh, is very often overlooked is the fact that um, databases really um, you know, change uh, over time, and um, there are a number of events that would trigger the need for a new parameter tuning session, right? So here I'm listing a few examples where that, that's the case. So think about, for example, if uh, your application changes, for example, if you change your queries, for example, in that case your workload changes and that will require a new uh, tuning session, right? So if you, for example, have a, like a read-heavy read versus uh, write-heavy applications, for example, those two applications will need to have a configuration for the database management system that depends on, uh, on specifically if they are read-heavy read or, 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 or write-heavy, for example. So every time that's, and there is a spectrum, of course, of, of configurations that would uh, um, provide higher performance uh, in, in the case where you are on this side of the spectrum or on this other side. And the um, databases, as, as mentioned, they grow and change. And when, once they grow, uh, the uh, parameter tuning as well should be re-performed uh, in, uh, in a prompt team. And uh, every time, uh, I think the first talk was talking about migrations as well. And every time there is a migration uh, from on-prem to cloud, for example, or vice versa, people are uh, doing, doing that as well, vice versa. You, uh, you're running basically on a new hardware, and uh, by that fact, then you want to be able to uh, do the parameter tuning as well in that case. If you scale up or down your instances, if you're you know, um, uh, changing the provisioning of, of your instances, for example, in that case, this is another example of uh, event that would trigger parameter tuning as well. And in case you're moving from one database management system to another one, you're migrating from Oracle to Postgres, for example, that's a, that's a good, uh, an important moment for, for, for tuning as well. And perhaps uh, unexpectedly as well, if you're changing version of Postgres as well, this may also lead to uh, higher performance if you review the way you configure your system. So this is a pretty long list, and this is uh, just to say that um, this problem is often overlooked, and uh, the, the, the way um, the way it looks like today is quite different from the idea that we should uh, keep this uh, uh, tuning happening regularly, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. So if we look at the complexity uh, of uh, this parameter tuning problem today, and here I'm, I'm using the MySQL uh, example, but Postgres is fairly similar. Um, we have, um, over the years, uh, an, an increase in number of parameters here on the y-axis that uh, is linearly increasing over the years. So there are about 600 parameters in, in my MySQL. Uh, there are about 300 parameters in Postgres uh, today. You can see that there's a linear increase over time. Linear increase means uh, an increase, exponential increase in, in, in complexity. So for, for those that have uh, um, you know, computational uh, science uh, background, this is a problem. This is an NP hard problem. Uh, so very challenging problem to solve where um, increasing the number of parameters uh, will uh, lead to an exponential increase of uh, the complexity of, of the problem. And uh, so if, uh, you know, if we look at how this problem is uh, solved today, um, you know, mainly the state of the art is uh, Maya tuning, which basically means that a person like our um, our uh, Magnus Agander, uh, our product leader, who has been doing this manual tuning for for decades at this point, uh, basically sits down in front of the console and uh, you know look at uh, what the uh, database is doing, uh, change some configuration parameters, and keeps iterating uh, over over perhaps uh, hours or days doing that, and if you want to do it well, it probably takes uh, you know, a few days to do, to do it well. So it's very slow, and it's painstaking in the sense that it needs uh, high expertise. So I'm mentioning Magnus as a, as a tuning, tuning guru. 
Um, I'm sure in the audience there are, there are people that have done this before, and if you're new to this uh, whole area and, and Postgres in general, it would be really, really challenging for you to do this. Uh, what you do, usually you go and look at blogs and try to figure it out, but it's it's actually quite quite challenging if you don't have several years of, of expertise on, on this problem. So this is also ineffective because um, very often applications change, as I was describing before in my long list of uh, triggering events for, for tuning. Things change, and uh, you know you would need to perhaps tune this again after after a week, and so starting the process again and again. And then it's also inadequate uh, because um, every time um, you know you, you get uh, uh, you know workloads also have variability, which are seasonal variabilities, but also daytime, nighttime, for example, or uh, you know Mondays that are different than Tuesdays, for example, and so you cannot really have a person that is always uh, manually tuning your your instance, uh, and um, by consequence the performance uh, that you can get from the manual tuning would kind of always be uh, you know subpar with respect to what you can uh, you can do um, in in general if you were always uh, you know there tuning your your system right and so people just leave uh, with that uh, with the idea. Yeah. Another uh, category uh, for resolving this problem here is uh, solutions are solutions that are based on heuristics, so heuristic-based approaches. And so these are these are solutions that uh, usually are uh, one size uh, fits all uh, solutions, meaning that um, you know, there are a number of rules that are uh, are coded in a, in an open source software usually, and uh, this uh, open source uh, software takes into account your machine model, so how, how much RAM do you have, how many CPUs do you have, things like that. And then they uh, spit out a solution, which is a configuration file, a pgconf, um, that you take and you put in your conf D, uh, and, uh, and, and you're done. So it's, it's great because they somewhat encapsulate all the knowledge that we have about this problem, so you don't need to go and look at, at the blogs and finding what's the right solution to your specific application, but they uh, basically t take into account, uh, you know, all the things that are known about this problem, uh, and they um, they write a tool that, uh, based on these rules, generates the best uh, configuration for your for your problem. Of course, though, this uh, doesn't really take into account your problem, really, in your application, right? So it's a solution that is generic. It's not bespoke in the sense that it's work workload agnostic, and. Um, and of course, also suffers from other problems that the um, you know the manual tuning as well, like the ineffective uh, and inadequate uh, aspects of uh, uh, manual tuning. So you may be familiar with PG Tune, for example. Uh, this is a tool that has been uh, extremely well uh, received and adopted over the years in uh, in the Postgres community. Uh, talking with uh, with the um, so with the founder of of that project, and uh, I. Uh, and learned that uh, there are about 10,000 downloads uh, of PG Tune every every month, uh, but maybe just about a thousand that are actually uh, being being used in in general. And there are other projects like, for example, the Postgres Configurator uh, by uh, Sempertech, for example, uh, which are which are extremely useful tools uh, in in that setting. However. What we would like to have, and this is a, a separate category here, it's a, it's a different approach, right? So we would like to have something that ideally um, learns by observation and auto-tunes your, 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 your specific uh, application, right? And uh, a solution that adapts to changing workloads, meaning that if I have a workload today, um, you know, in, in a month I have a different workload, I would like to be able to use a solution that perhaps has push a button and will optimize each individual uh, workload uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, you know, in, in a bespoke way, right? So this is the ideal uh, scenario. It's a different approach from, from the other scenarios, and it's based on the fact that your workload is running in a specific environment, in a specific machine, in a specific server, with a specific, a specific workload. And all these things together, by observation, can be perhaps uh, tuned based on, on this amount of information, these telemetrics that inform you on what is actually happening on the machine. So it's it's a different solution from the one size fits all because it really is learning based on the um, the you know the the actual usage of uh, of, of 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 your hardware. 
Right. The uh, way this uh, parameter tuning is uh, mostly done today um, is very different than that, right? Um, let's uh, let's be very clear. So tuning today is typically a reactive uh, approach to something going really really wrong. So if you have done tuning maybe once, then after maybe uh, some some weeks or a few a few months, you see that your performance is really going down. And you go back and you say, okay, so let's fix this now because we cannot do business anymore, basically. So it's a, it's a not, pro, not, not a proactive approach, it's a reactive approach. And this is often looked at maybe once or twice a year, while, uh, as I was describing before, this would require uh, much more attention. And it's often neglected. Uh, as a, not a, a priority, and uh, the reason is uh, very uh, often uh, the fact that you often need to engage with expensive external consultants uh, and uh, uh, people that know how to do this manually to solve this problem, and uh, you can uh, um, you can often also um, just over provision your your instances to to basically solve the problem. So instead of using a small instance, and you use a much bigger instance. And people very often uh, do uh, that. So the, this is the model of Randy that has become uh, the uh, common, most common practice today, which is basically to take uh, to throw more hardware and, and compute at any issue you have. But of course, this is very dangerous because this is a side effect that your uh, operational cost will be much, much uh, higher now, right? So if we look at this uh, operational cost specifically, and we look at the uh, FinOps angle, and uh, FinOps stands for Financial DevOps, which is a fairly new department that uh, now many companies have. Um, it's basically looking at the infrastructure cost um, and uh, how to optimize, specifically uh, how to optimize this infrastructure cost, which is, um, according to this uh, study by Andresin and Horowitz here, driving valuations and stock uh, down. And so here is the example of uh, how much of the um, cloud spend it's, uh, it's used by, by these companies, for, for example, uh, on, on this uh, article here. Um, and the fact that uh, some, some companies that uh, have uh, gone through the journey of digital transformation from their on-prem uh, to, 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 to the cloud, uh, they are even thinking about going back, right? And this is a, this is a phenomenon that we are seeing sometimes uh, these days. Like there's an example of Dropbox, for example, that did this uh, a little while ago, so went uh, back to uh, being uh, an on-prem um, service. And uh, they, um, by doing that, they saved uh, millions and millions of dollars, right? So, and, and this, is, uh, this is something that while it's extremely challenging to go back on-prem, and people don't want to do that in general, uh, we should be really careful in optimizing then the software that runs in the cloud so that uh, the cost doesn't go uh, over, over the top. And this is pretty much the solution that uh, Andresin and Arowitz uh, mentioned in uh, this uh, article. So the idea of going back on-prem, it's, it's a little, uh, um, it's a little uh, challenging uh, and and uh, but if you keep your software really um, uh, tuned, then you can you can achieve this uh, higher savings in terms of uh, and, and just use the resources you really need and you're not wasting uh, your resources. So if we look at, at some stats from uh, from the cloud market, for example, um, sixty four percent of uh, of uh, of the companies in, in this other article here spending more uh, on cloud than originally budgeted, and very often they spend uh, about 18% uh, more, and 35% uh, of uh, all cloud spend is, is wasted in, in, in general. Um, so that these numbers really kind of highlight the fact that there is a lot of um, uh, waste and there is, uh, there is over provisioning that often takes uh, the uh, the stage to solve all sorts of problems and this is a, this is a major concern for many uh, companies today and many finops uh, departments as well so here we introduce a, a solution uh, called Bitune, which is this uh, third category that I was describing before uh, it's a, a AI powered database unit cloud hosted service it's based on machine learning 
just because machine learning allows you to have this ideal scenario where you're observing what's happening on the machine and reacting uh, conse consequently uh, with respect to what the, uh, the algorithm is seeing in, in real time. The Ramgi adaptation means that uh, this will provide a solution which is bespoke to the workload that uh, it's seen. So if you have uh, two different workloads running at uh, two different times of the day, you want to have a solution which is specific to each one of those workloads. It's very easy to use, no background in AI or database tuning is needed. And it's highly scalable because uh, it's based on a, on a software as a service, so it's an optimizer as a service. At least then on a software as a service that can scale to hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of instances. So the main uh, value propositions for DBTune are uh, the fact that you can reduce your cloud infrastructure costs, and we will uh, double click on on this aspect here in in a minute. I want to um, just uh, make this very very concrete. And the um, second point is that you make your service radically faster. In, in practice, if you have been optimizing an instance for a long time manually, perhaps you know, the performance will not be game changers. But the idea here is that uh, you, know, you, you can still match the level of quality of you know, the best humans on the planet by doing this entirely uh, automatically. And this will also now spit out a solution which is bespoke to uh, your specific workload while sometimes uh, the business administrators will need to um, uh, provide a solution that works uh, perhaps uh, in general with respect to many different uh, uh, workloads. And the uh, idea uh, is that uh, we make life a little easier for the business administrators and developers. Uh, of course, the business administrators and developers are busy doing many, many other things, and so parameter tuning is a fairly narrow task that needs to be done regularly, and we basically can automate now this task so that uh, the business administrators, engineers, and uh, developers can uh, focus on other important uh, and pressing matters as well. And then there is the reduction of energy consumption, which is another aspect which is also fairly important, especially if you're a large company that runs thousands and thousands of these uh, database instances at the same time. All right, from a technical perspective, I will give a quick overview on uh, the architecture uh, that um, is uh, DBTune. So we have uh, here on uh, the left, we have uh, a Postgres uh, instance. And here on the right, we have the optimizer as a service. Here is the internet in the middle. And this is a, a DBTune controller, which is an open source controller that contains two subparts. So the first one is an actuator. And the second one is a monitor. So the actuator simply takes a recommendation from the optimizer and installs a configuration file in, in the conf D, in Postgres conf D, um, which then uh, will basically configure by consequence this machine, this uh, machine, this database management system, and in a way that this will then run for, for, for a little while. Uh, the model will capture the telemetrics coming from uh, this database instance and it will return uh, this telemetrics, this performance telemetrics to the optimizer. So the optimizer now is able to get an idea of uh, what's going on on the left side, will build some complex probabilistic models, and then will uh, provide a second recommendation that will uh, send to the actuator. The actuator will uh, use that configuration to configure the system and uh, the monitor will again measure the new performance coming from the set configuration and report back the telemetrics to the optimizer. So this process is an iterative process that goes on for about a couple of hours in total. And after a couple of hours, this uh, um, you know, back and forth uh, type of uh, adaptive method will uh, spit out um, a final uh, configuration, which is the one that the uh, you know the Postgres instance will, will use to achieve high performance, and the um, I think the uh, you know the, the advantage of this process is that you can achieve the full optimization in uh, in just a couple of hours, which is very very convenient, and it's fully automated. So you don't need to, um, you know, you, you, you have a, a dashboard that allows you to check the progress in real time, but you don't need to be actively doing anything. You can just watch the console and, and the performance improvement is just happening in, in real time. And, and it's also private because the, um, 
DB2 controller here, uh, it's an open source that can, it's written in Python, it can be audited, um, you know, takes probably about 20 minutes if you're fluent in Python to uh, learn what uh, is happening here in, in this controller. And the idea here is that, um, you know, it doesn't look inside the tables and it just uh, is interested in the, um, you know, performance telemetrics, not, not the content of the table. So in terms of privacy, uh, this is um, this is safe to use in that sense. The architecture for the RDS type of solutions is uh, slightly different. I will, um, uh, for the sake of time, I will, I will skip uh, through this a little quickly. But let's uh, look at uh, some performance uh, results uh, that um, we uh, we have here on uh, Amazon RDS and the TPCC um, uh, workload here. Um, famous uh, industry standard benchmark for this type of experiments. So here we have uh, time on the x-axis and uh, on the y-axis we have uh, transactions per second. So if you um, are a user of Amazon RDS, which is the relational database service at uh, Amazon, uh, you basically get a configuration of your database management system that is different from the Postgres default uh, and it's uh, better because it reflects the machine size, the machine, uh, you know, the, the instance that you're that you're um, that you're getting from from them. Uh, here, for example, the performance of the RDS default on this M5 to X large, it's about 850 transactions per second. So here on the on the y-axis, I have throughput in in form of transactions per second, and this uh, you know TPCC. Um, benchmark um, runs for, 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 for several hours here on the x-axis and uh, it stays uh, pretty flat. Of course there is variation and not representing that uh, noise uh, variation there but the uh, RDS solution doesn't change over time which means that it gives you like a solution which is which is flat uh, in that sense. If you double the size of the uh, database instance what you see with the uh, M5 4 large that you've managed to double the performance as well. So you get 1,900 transactions per second, which is great. It doesn't happen all the time. You just double the uh, size of your instance and you get double performance. This is happening here in this very specific case. Then uh, you can, for example, use things like PGTune. We saw this as a heuristic-based uh, solution. PGTune uh, it manages to increase the performance from 850 to about 1,100 transactions per second. And then we look at the... Um, performance that you get with dbtune, and you also see that the behavior that you get with dbtune on the small instance, so I'm talking here about the M5 to X large, this is the small instance, which is the same one as this red uh, curve here. You see that the uh, dbtune uh, uh, tool uh, works in a different way. So the service uh, changes the performance over time and adapts uh, slowly to match the high level of performance you can get from uh, uh, observing what's going on in the machine and then adapting over time. So at the end of the day, uh, it converges into this uh, level of performance, which is about, you know, uh, a little more than 1900, which is roughly uh, the same or even slightly better than the performance you get with the uh, large instance. So you can see this in two ways, right? So now you have something that performs as well as small instance that performs as well as an instance, which is literally double the size. Or uh, you can think about the fact that if you if you if you were using this small instance, now you have an instance that's much more performing, much more performant than than the previous one, right? So this is uh, in uh, in terms of um, in terms of what you can get, like this 2x improvement with respect to the RDS default, which is which is a lot of performance left on the table if you if you don't do this, right? So it's uh, a lot of improvement uh, to to be uh, taken into consideration here. So if we look at the um, financials of this, you can see that in terms of hardware, the M5 to X large is the small instance with uh, you know four cores, and if you use the big instance, you have four eight cores. RAM is double as well, disk is double. And if you look at the price of the instance, you, you, you get these numbers here, the disk uh, price is this. If there's two numbers, you get this number here. And this plot is just showing again what I was showing before, the fact that db June uh, on the small instance achieves almost uh, similar performance, uh, a slightly higher performance than, than the large instance, which basically means that over the year, over one year, for one database instance, you're basically saving $8,000 just for one database instance. And so now we know that 
large uh, companies have uh, many of these instances, even even hundreds uh, or thousands of these instances, as you as you may uh, have seen in your uh, own experience as well. So this is eight thousand dollars per database instance is spent by over provisioning, basically, and so which basically means that if you have uh, tens and tens of these instances, you can very quickly go into the multi-million dollar um, you know, a waste of, uh, and that's why the FinOps departments are really careful into this type of problems now. And in uh, in general, uh, you can reduce by uh, you know your your overall cost uh, by a large margin based on this example. So similarly, if we look at the Azure Postgres flexible server, you get something very similar. Uh, you know, we'll not go very much in details for, for the sake of time here, but you see that this is slightly different instances. They are slightly cheaper, uh, and then so the, the overall, uh, you know, you, you double the performance. You actually get even slightly better uh, than double the performance. You get this $6,000 per database instance per year, um, and, and that's, uh, again, just uh, re, 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 uh, rehashing the idea that um, you know, by choice, you can really save uh, a lot in terms of cloud cost. All right, some other. So I'm showing RDS. Uh, if you look at um, other benchmarks uh, as well, so this is running on EC2. This is uh, the um, uh, solution that runs on, on EC2, not, not on RDS. And for example, another uh, benchmark, the Wikipedia OTP bench benchmark, for example, you see that uh, you 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 know the default. Configuration, uh, it's it's pretty bad. PG Tune gets you a pretty good boost in performance, and if you now use DB Tune, you get an additional uh, performance improvement here, and uh, the same for for latency as well. So I'll go a little faster on this CH benchmark. Similar results. Very often you can you can find this 2x improvement in performance by by parameter tuning. The performance in general can go all the way from uh, you know. Uh, 20, 30 percent to all the way up to 10x. So sometimes we see performance improvement that uh, has a big jump from, you know, literally 10x, uh, not much more. Uh, you, you can get if if uh, the machine learning algorithm is really able to find what's uh, going wrong, then you get this uh, kind of very uh, important uh, performance improvement. So some uh, use cases uh, that have um, run DBTune in the production system. Uh, here, um, I use this slide here because uh, maybe you, you're familiar with this uh, with this company. I uh, tell uh, a large communication service provider in, in India uh, where we were uh, running DBTune on their production system for for their uh, field engineers uh, large uh, system. Uh, there, until the same, uh, the experience was pretty uh, seamless in the sense that um, the uh, CTO himself run, run this on the production system. It took, it took about 10 minutes uh, according to, to what uh, his experience uh, was. And uh, the, you know, the um, example of the visualizer as well and, uh, and, and VMware as well. The VMware case is interesting because we uh, run DBTune on a different database management system, and this was showing that uh, the machine learning technology can also generalize to other database management systems, so not just Postgres, but also tackle other database management systems, in, in this case, Foundation DB. And we've, we've done this exercise a few times where we used DBTune to optimize other uh, database management systems other than, uh, than Postgres. And so this um, and this, this is a, a, an interesting property of uh, the machine learning driven approach as well that can generalize across different database management systems. And um, I will um, perhaps keep it there. Just wanted to uh, briefly mention that uh, we are um, giving uh, training sessions on DBTune and uh, we did this in Prague uh, last uh, January. And we will uh, try to uh, submit uh, an application, I think deadline is tomorrow, for the PGConf uh, in February uh, in, um, in Bangalore. So if you are interested in, uh, to try this out, uh, you know, this uh, takes um, a little you know, one hour training to basically get used to just using this on a, on a synthetic workload and then translating this to your production system would be also pretty easy at that point. So, 
um, join us uh, the session and hopefully I think that the people that will be reviewing the application for this uh, call for papers and call for, for, for trainings are in this room. So if uh, you see interest in the room, please accept the application at the conference as well. All right, so you can use DBTune today if you access uh, uh, the app.dbtune.com and feel free to also reach out if you have any questions and you would like to, to ask us for a demo or uh, any additional information on, on, on this. So thank you very much. This is all I have for today. It was really great to meeting you and, and, uh, and, and talking about DBTune to uh, the Hyderabad Postgres user group today. Thank you so much. Can you? Luigi, there is a question in the room. Hi, Luigi. Okay. Stop. Can I you give some details on the machine learning model and the training process and what data sets you've been using? Awesome. If I understand, Tom is asking uh, what's the data that we use in specifically this, uh, what, what's the data that we monitor from the Postgres instance? Right, Tom? Yes, that's the question, uh, Luigi. Okay, good. Uh, can I hear you very well? So I want to make sure I understood the question. So the, the monitoring uh, part here looks at things like what what's the uh, memory usage, CPU usage, disk, throughput, query runtime, uh, things like that. So things that are really specific to the performance that the, 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 the controller is seeing on the given machine. And specifically, also what I was saying before is that we don't need, need to look inside the tables. Uh, we just look at the uh, performance uh, itself. So these uh, performance metrics then are reported and the machine learning models are trained on this very large amount of data. Does that ask the question? Does that answer your question, Tom? Uh, can he mention how he gets to the optimal parameters? Uh, Luigi, to extend on that question, how do you uh, arrive at uh, a certain parameter value? Optimal, optimal values. Yeah. How do you arrive at an optimal value? So the, uh, the way the machine learning uh, optimizer here, this uh, component here, gets to the optimal value is by monitoring the system on the left and building a probabilistic model, which basically models the parameter space which is based by shared buffers and mem and all the other parameters. That's the parameter space. And reflects, so the, the, the probabilistic model then reflects the parameter space with respect to the performance that um, is the uh, data uh, flowing in in the model. Right? So the performance is used, used to basically learn these models. Um, this sort of models are often called uh, response to phase type of models, where basically you now have a model that tells you based on a configuration in this uh, parameter space, what's the performance that the machine learning model would uh, believe would uh, uh, be if, if that, that configuration specifically was used, that parameter setting was used. And now based on these models now, uh, what you can do is to kind of help this iterative process that I was describing before here, going back and forth and changing the parameters over time in an iterative process, now you can use these models to basically guide that optimization in a way that uh, the results will look better and better over time, but at the same time you're also refining these models over time. So as soon as you get more data, uh, more telemetrics, more performance data, the models also get more refined and they understand better and better over time what this uh, response to phase looks like. 
And so by doing that for, for a little while, and I think that the real breakthrough of DBTune, which is based on about 10 years of research at, at institutions like Stanford and Imperial College and, and so on, the, the real breakthrough here, uh, which is uh, probably the reason why this wasn't done before, is that um, you know, DBTune is really, really good at doing this very quickly. And this is something we call statistical efficiency. Um, meaning that uh, you know you don't need to do this for a million times before you actually get it. You can do it for 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 a little while, and it gives you the uh, a good approximation of the optimal, right? That's that's the key point. Thank you, Luigi. Uh, one other question Like statistics, like uh, query plans, how much over it does that add to the database itself? What are the monitoring methods? So, Luigi, the question is uh, whatever that the uh, controllers uh, uh, install, right now, how, how much of overhead is added? I, I cannot, cannot, sorry, guys, I, I cannot hear you. I am uh, struggling. Let me, let me try it first. Can you get closer to the microphone, maybe? How much of overhead do we add with the DBTune? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see, I see. I got the question. Thank you. Thank you for repeating that. Uh, the overhead of DBTune um, is very, very small. Of course, every time you probe something, you add a little bit of overhead because you need to gather the data. But here we're talking a very, very small amount. And you know the um, so the, the data collection here it's uh, um, you know you, you you could think about that like a very small percentage like a you know a two percent one percent uh, additional uh, overhead that is being basically mounted in, in in the monitoring phase but um, think about almost zero basically. So this wasn't this wasn't a concern. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Sir. How about licensing cost under, for example, uh, a GB2 instance is one to one relationship or one to many? Or, uh, I think we'll take that question offline. Uh, Tom will be able to. Oh, sure. Okay. We had one final question. Yeah. Luigi, uh, those were the questions from the room. Uh, thanks so much for. Uh, Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much for having me. That was a, that was my pleasure.